confirm that today. Hold up your Bible and let's say it like we mean it. I believe the Bible is God's Word. Inerrant. Infallible. Inspired. Authoritative. Relevant. I will, by God's grace, obey it and apply it to my life today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm trying to figure out how to, oh, there you go. It's a little push button on that light. For the blind old guy. I got to be able to see my notes and most importantly, the Word of God. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. We are moving through this book verse by verse. Yes, I understand last week I ran out of time and so we knocked off that last section. It's your responsibility. Berean Christians, to take that last section that we didn't have time to cover and cover it. Read through it, study it. It is God's Word and some good stuff in there. Well, we got a new sermon series starting on Sunday, September 8th. A really exciting sermon series called Courageous Faith, a study in the book of Joshua. And I'm psyched about that. I'm spending a lot of time preparing for that. But it starts September 8th, and if, if I didn't keep going... We wouldn't be finished at this series in time for that one. So today, um, 1 John chapter 4, the title of the sermon today is Testing the Spirits and Love One Another. Testing the Spirits and Love One Another. Read, read along with me or actually follow along as I read aloud uh, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Let's actually keep reading. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Authentic Christianity. That's what we're talking about. That's what the Apostle John's talking about. Not a phony Christianity, but authentic Christianity. The world, the, the, the world is, they don't realize it, 
but, but they're hungering to see an authentic Christian. And, and uh, that's what God's called us to be. We're to test, though, in the process of being an authentic Christian, we're to test the spirits, and we're to love one another, those two, that doctrinal soundness on the one hand, and for the Christian, and love on the other hand, the, the, these churches, churches around the world that are doctrinally pure and loving. Those two never separated love and truth. Like in Proverbs chapter 3, the writer saying, let not mercy or love and truth forsake you. Always keep love and truth right together. If you separate the two, then it's not true love. If you separate the two, the, the two, then you're not proclaiming truth, or truth becomes, without love, harshness. It, 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 it becomes very harsh and, and honestly offensive when you don't have love and truth together. So, why are we to test the spirits? Well, I want to say this. I believe what John is saying to us is there is a demonic spirit. You know, there are spirits, right? Angels. There are those that two-thirds of the created beings called angels or spirits, two-thirds of the ones that God made stayed with God when the great rebellion happened in heaven, when Lucifer, when Satan, the devil, right? When he fell away, when he rebelled against God, um, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14 talks about it in the Old Testament. A third of the angels went with Satan in the rebellion. And those spirits, those demons, are what John's talking about, the apostle, when he says, how do you test? You've got to test the spirit. Behind a teaching is either a, a heavenly spirit, an angelic spirit, if you will, holiness, God, or you've got a demonic origin of it. You've got a demon behind it. Um, if you look at that, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So why are we to test the spirits? To see if they are from God. Either from God or from Satan. No in between. Because there are many false teachers. That's why we're to test the spirit. When I say to you that a false teaching is the prosperity movement or prosperity teaching. If you understand what I'm talking about, raise your hand. I'm going to kind of see where the body is. The, essentially, that false teaching, which has just been around, I don't know, probably forever, but uh, in my lifetime, I've noticed um, 20 or 30 years of this false teaching, which basically said, uh, a lot of times it's manifested, you know, we see it on television. You listen to some preacher and he says to you, you send me a thousand dollars, or excuse me, you send me a hundred dollars and God will give you a thousand. And it's always connected to a fleshly tied into you got something to gain. Um, you know, give me this amount of money and God's going to give you this amount of money. It's all, it's, it's using scriptures about giving in, in a selfish way. And if you'll notice, the prosperity preachers and teachers, they typically, um, they drive very expensive cars. They live in these exorbitantly, eccentrically wealthy, big castle-like homes, you know, that have so many fireplaces and restrooms, you could never make your way through all of them. Uh, they, they tend to be what? People who want to satisfy their fleshly desires themselves, and they get following by promising people, if you follow me and what I'm teaching, you too can live in the seven million dollar castle. You too can drive the Bentley or whatever. Uh, that's prosperity teaching. That's a prosperity gospel. It's false. And some of you, I understand some of you actually got born again I got a dear friend in our church, got born again by a prosperity preacher. You know why? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves. And that particular prosperity preacher, one Sunday, he actually proclaimed the true gospel. And one of our brothers in the church, I won't say who it is, but that brother got saved. 
He truly was born again because he was saved by hearing the word of God at that moment, and he was saved. Yeah, amen. But listen, that's false teaching. That's a path you don't want to go down, and that's, that's, a, that's a false prophet. The false prophets that promote that. Let me tell you a bigger group today, though, than prosperity, preachers, teachers. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label it in the spirit of revelation. Do you remember the seven churches? There was one that started with an L. It was the Laodicean church. I think... I think there's a whole nother big category of false teachers. Now, I'm not putting them in the ground or in the same plane as a heretic. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. They're just lukewarm. They're just compromisers. They're just carnal. But it's a whole group. I think it's the vast majority of evangelical churches in our country. It's the reason why we as a people elect the snakes, the, the politicians that get elected, it's because the church has been fed a steady diet of pablum instead of the meat of the word. They've not been discipled. Let me tell you, this is the Laodicean message. You ready? The Laodicean preachers, teachers do this. They talk a lot about God's love. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. That's all you hear about is that beautiful quality of God. And in fact, that quality of God is addressed in today's text. So God does love you. But listen, here's the problem. They talk a lot about God's love, but without God's truth. They separate the truth of God from God's love. You can't do that. If you do that, you get out of balance. They talk a lot about God's blessing without obedience. If I'm... If I'm connecting with somebody and you've seen this false teaching before, say amen. Not amen that you're agreeing with that false teaching. It's these people talk a lot about God's blessing without obedience. The teaching is man-centered, not God-centered, right? It's all about what's in it for me, right? You're almost, these churches have become slick, slick, slick advertisers They've learned how to fill up their pews, but without preaching the whole counsel of God, the truth of God. Just by telling people, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, you know, just as long as you come and you put a little money in the offering basket to keep the machine going. It's Laodicean, it's lukewarm, and God, how does God like his coffee? He likes it hot, and um, he doesn't like it lukewarm if it's lukewarm. What does he want to do? He wants to throw it up out of his mouth. Heretical teachers. Listen, when why are we to test the spirits, right? We want to see if they're from God. Now, this is a whole nother category. These are the ones, I mean, that, wow, you are not to even have in your home. You understand the difference? I minister to some Laodicean preachers, and I plead with them privately, please stop tickling ears. Deal with the whole Word of God, and I do that. I deal with that directly with them. They're in my home. I'm in their home. I'm challenging them, right? But the next category, we are commanded. You don't even have them in your home. These are the heretics. These are these militant preachers, teachers, even, ready, even singers, they are militantly heretical in their philosophies, in their teachings. You say, how many of you recently, and I, I bet you many in our worship arts ministry, have grieved along with me about Marty Sampson with Hillsong? You've read about that, you've heard about that. Marty Sampson at a young age, a very young age, may have been 16, I'm not sure, got linked up with that big movement called Hillsong. You know, the whole Hillsong praise songs and all that. And there's some good stuff coming out of that, right? I mean, I've sung along with them. But what happened was this guy wrote songs for him. He sang. He, he was elevated to a position of, wow, he's the guru. We got to look to Marty Sampson. The problem was Marty Sampson was being fed a diet of false teaching and Laodicean kind of hybrid, the man didn't even learn and understand basic, sound Christian doctrine. 
So all of a sudden now he's got millions of followers and he comes out just a few weeks ago and he says, I renounce it all. I renounce Christianity. It's all a sham. It's no different than all the other religions of the world. And all of his Christian followers, some of them Christian followers, some of them maybe deluded, not really Christians, but they're following. And he comes out and he does that. He renounces the faith. How many of you are familiar with the name Joshua Harris? I kiss dating goodbye, one million copies sold when the man was 20 years old. Elevated, what did we do? Society, evangelical Christianity, elevated him. The whole homeschooling movement. We don't date, we court. He, I mean, that's what the whole book was about. And there was some good stuff in that book. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Bath but here's this guy. We elevated this guy that didn't even have a real sense of sound doctrine. Because of his celebrity status, they made him a pastor of a mega church. Well, then all of a sudden, he just came out. And he's renounced his Christian faith. But he's not just renouncing his Christian faith quietly. He's telling everybody, all his contacts, he's trying to pull as many as he can in. And then the week after he renounced his Christian faith, he goes and he, and he says, I am so sorry to all the LGBTQ brothers and sisters that I spoke the truth. Well, he didn't say the truth, but that I hated on them. And so the next week, he marched in a gay pride parade and ate rainbow-colored cupcakes. Let me tell you something. Brethren, sistren, believe not every spirit. If I get up here and I start telling you something that's contrary to the word of God, I don't care if at that point we got a Christian life building and we're running 10 times the number of people we have here and we have people watching this on YouTube and Facebook live stream and this. It doesn't matter if by then I've written a series of books and if I start promoting something that doesn't line up with the evangelical, godly, core teaching, you got to renounce it. you got to forsake it. Tar and feather me and run me out of town after you try to privately restore me through biblical means. And if I won't be restored, you're out of here. Not, not, not because you don't love me, not because you don't care. But you can't tolerate that kind of false teacher stuff in Christ's church. Do I hear an amen? we got to be militant about this. And I mean, what? we got to be militantly loving about this. Never separating love and truth. So you got Marty Sampson. you got Joshua Harris. Five years ago, when I taught through this series, right as we were starting this church, I taught through 1 John. And uh, I mentioned a guy named Ron Bell. Ron Bell was a preacher teacher of the word of God, maybe written a book. Well, he came out with a new book and he was interviewed by Oprah five years ago. And he said, I no longer believe there's a literal hell because if God is a God of love, God could never, ever, ever, ever make such a despicable, horrible place. He renounced the faith, denied, said, I have nothing to do with Christianity anymore, walked away. But he did it as loudly as he could to shame and hurt as many people as he could to try to hurt the cause of Christianity. You see, we got, we got to test the Spirit. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make this statement because you know me. I love, I love, I love, I love. And you ready? I came out of the womb with a full set of teeth. And I was smiling. I'm a smiler. There are some smilers on television with massive followings. And they've written books with blessed in it. And they smile, and they smile, and they smile a lot. But there's so much false teaching, and so much Laodicean teaching coming out. Be not deceived. Don't think that false teachers or heretics are just this real mean, mean people. No, they're charismatic people. They're, they know how to get people to follow them. You either use the charisma God gives you and the gifting God gives you, for God and God alone, or you use it for selfish sakes to turn your net worth into multi, multi, multi millions from the ministry. See where I'm going? Don't be deceived. Test the spirits. By the way, 
The first point I'm taking the longest time on because I feel like it's a point that's got to really be hammered. We're in a day and age where we desperately, we desperately need to test the Spirit. We really do. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take it a step further. How many of you deluded creatures? No, I'm serious. How many of you, how many of you, uh, I do, by the way, how many of you have a Baptist background? Can I see your hand? Okay. I love every one of you. And I'm telling you, the Baptist denomination really is doing a lot of good. It is. We're a non-denominational church, but we have a lot of Baptist, foundational Baptist type stuff, and I'm not ashamed of that. But let me tell you something. There is a movement afoot within Southern Baptist. There is a whole group within Southern Baptist promoting false teaching. It's subtle. It's subtle. Anybody familiar with the social justice movement? Sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, who wouldn't be for social justice after all, right? The problem is the movement's connected to Marxism, an anti-Christian, anti-Christ concept promoted by an anti-Christ man. Social justice sounds good, and certainly we are for justice as Christians, Christians but it's, it's not about the way God defines justice. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's a whole big package deal that does not look at people through the grid of Scripture, but looks at people through a Marxist ideology of haves and have-nots. we got to watch out for it. That's creeping up within Southern Baptist Convention right now, and there's some good people getting swept into it. Anybody heard of the emergent church? Yeah, bad, bad. That's really a group. A lot of those churches are younger congregations, and they get some little whippersnapper like Josh Harris that's got some celebrity status, but they're not trained in the Holy Word of God. And they start promoting all these ideologies they learned in the public school system. You're like, oh, really? And, and they're, they're big on that social justice movement. But let me tell you something. Social justice movement is a false gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ, the God-man. God the Father sent his only begotten son. He was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he lived a perfect, sinless life, 33 years. And he voluntarily offered himself to be crucified to pay for our sins. The sins, all sins that have ever been committed. And anybody that will receive him by faith alone will be saved and will not go to hell one day. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not the gospel to say we've got to pay reparations for what this, rep this country did in a reprehensible fashion 150, 200 years ago in terms of slavery. That's not the gospel. The gospel is what I said just right before that. That's the gospel. And churches are beginning to get the focus off of the gospel and truly teaching the whole counsel of God. All right, don't, don't panic. Don't look and say, we got seven points, and I've timed how long it took them to do point one. I'm going to have you out of here today a little early before two, okay? <laughs> turn, turn the... Oh, real quick, i got to give you this. This is a little more, a little more. False teachers have always been around since the beginning. And by the way, if I ever preach over, some of you are to blame because you always say to me, Pastor, don't look at the clock. Don't look at the clock. And the vast majority of you are like, please look at the clock. Everybody turn around. Look at the size of the clock they put on the back wall for me. Come on. Uh, anyway, false teachers have been around for, since the beginning. Janice and Jambres, what did they do? They tried to imitate the miracles of Moses. Um, Simon, I think it's Magus, he was trying to imitate the miracles of Philip. Hitler lived by the mantra, tell the lie long enough and loud enough, and eventually people will do what? People will believe it. All right, turn to the next page in your notes. Number two, how do we test the spirits? 1 John 4, 2 through 6 says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Okay, remember when we opened up the series, we talked about a massive doctrinal heresy that was coming, emanating from certain leaders who had been in the church, but who had renounced the church. But they're still wanting to try to speak back into the church. Kind of like Joshua Harris is. 
He's still trying to speak back into the church, even though he's denied the Christian faith. These people were the same way. So hear me, write this down. Docetic Gnosticism. Docetic Gnosticism said very clearly that Jesus had no flesh. He had no body. He was a phantom. He was a spirit. When you looked at him, it looked like he had a body, but he really didn't have a body. He was a ghost. He was a phantom. And so what is John doing? John is saying that's heretical. That's false doctrine. That's false teaching. John, the apostle John is saying docetic Gnosticism is wrong. Without Jesus having a body, he can't be your savior. So number one, how do you test the spirits? Number one, find out what they say about Jesus Christ. I'll come back to that. Find out what they say about Jesus Christ. Okay, now this guy named Serentheus that we talked about, he came up with a thing called Serentian Gnosticism. You know, he was an egomaniac and he wanted to have his own name connected to it. He basically said, wait a second, Jesus had a body but he didn't have the Spirit of God on him. It simply came on him when he was baptized, and then it left him before he died on the cross. What's the problem with that? If, if he's not fully God and fully man, he can't save us from our sins, right? If he's not fully God, he doesn't have the power to save us. If he's not fully man, then he cannot take our place. He can't be our substitute. He can't be, if you will, the last Adam. He has to be God and man. That's the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ, he, you know, that God took on human form. So, so John the apostle is saying false teaching, docetic Gnosticism, false teaching, Serentian Gnosticism. you got to have the package. What do they do with Jesus? There is a big, massive religious group. I hope I don't offend anybody, but this is truth. I want to give it lovingly, but there's a big, massive religious group of people, and many of them are sincere. They're beautiful people God loves, but they're deceived. You know what they're doing with Jesus? By the way, there's a lot of them in Utah. Okay, what, what I'm saying is they, what do they do with Jesus? They say Jesus was not always God. He did not eternally exist as God. They say he became God ready? Let me keep going with the false doctrine of that group. They said he became God, and guess what? You can become God. And men, you can become God, and you can have 14 wives bear your children and have your own planet. It's just false doctrine. What do they do with Jesus? You want to test the Spirit? What do they do with Jesus? What do they do with Jesus? You can do that with any of them. You ready? Another major religion says it's Jesus plus trust and faith in the blessed Virgin Mary. Or it's Jesus to save you plus your good works. It's Jesus, but you got to go to the confessional. I hope I'm not offending anybody. I'm giving you truth. You see, there's only one priest. It's our high priest, and his name is it's Jesus. What do they do with Jesus? That's the issue. And that's how you, I'm telling you, you can spot it. You're a Christian. You can spot it. We're going to talk about another thing there. So what do they do with Jesus? Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is a spirit of what? Of Antichrist of which you've heard that it is coming now is already in the world. Listen, everybody circle the word anti. Anti can mean there um, two different things. It can either mean against Antichrist, against Christ, or more deceptively. You ready? It can mean instead of Christ. Right? Right? Me instead of Christ. Do any of you remember that wacko from Waco, David Koresh, a few years ago? You remember following those reports and all that? That guy was a loony. He was a false prophet. He was an antichrist. You say, how do you know that? I'll tell you why. And I know my fellow seminarian sitting here with me, was, he was talking to the television set when he saw all the stories. This guy was... He was, he was taking Revelation 5, which is about the Lamb of God, which is about none other than Jesus Christ himself, the only one worthy to open up the seals, right? The seals and the bowls and the trumpets and the judgments. 
only Jesus, only the Lamb of God. He equated himself as the Lamb of God. This guy said, I am the Christ. Well, I can tell you, he wasn't the Christ. He was a crisper. And he got a little foreshadowing. When he was burned up, he had a foreshadowing of what was waiting for him after he breathed his last breath here. He's in hell. And I say, I say that because all that reject the Christ, Jesus, all that reject Christ will spend eternity in hell separated from God. That's the truth. We test by what do they do with Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 5, For many shall come in my name, and what will they say? I am the Christ, and shall deceive a few or many. They'll deceive many. But I got a word for you. You ready? It's impossible. One of the signs that you're truly a child of God, not a child of Satan, is you cannot be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. Do you understand? You cannot, and I'll tell you why. Look at number three. What is the key to overcoming false teaching and false teachers? Remembering and acting on the fact that greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in you, brother? Who is in you, sister? The Holy Spirit of Almighty God indwells you. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. I am telling you, that psychs me up so much. When my kids would be scared, a lightning storm, when they were small, small, small children. Got you covered there, kid. The, the kids were scared. I would come in, and this was following their receiving Jesus Christ. I would say, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Or if there was fear of the boogeyman or whatever, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Well, the way that we can stand up and discern what is false teaching, what is a false spirit, what is a spirit of Antichrist, is we rely on the Spirit of God speaking to us through the Word of God to enlighten us. You can see it. Now look at that next point. How do we test the spirits? We find out, find out what they say and do with the Word of God. See this right here? You say, where are you getting that? Look down at verse 6. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. Listens to whom? Listens to the apostles. You see, the apostles were bringing the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God from God Himself. It was breathed out of God's mouth. Theopneustos. God breathed. He inspired it, right? He, what does he say? You want to test the spirits? What do they do with the Word of God? What do these religions do? Do they add another book to it? Oh, yeah, we believe the Bible. Oh, but we've got this other book that you just got to have. It's on the same level as the Bible. Well, that's a spirit of Antichrist. Whoever adds or takes away from the words of this book, God says I'll add to them all the plagues and judgments and wrath found in this book. You can't do that. What do they do with the Word of God? That's how you can discern. So listen, if, if, if you're thinking, man, how do I keep track of all this stuff? I want you just to sink two things in that are really the best safety net. What do they do with Jesus and what do they do with the Word of God? And you can, you can spot them. You can spot them. P.T. Barnum made a fortune on the theory that a sucker is born every minute. And unfortunately, there are many false teachers who are carrying that same philosophy out under the guise of religion. What is the key to overcoming false teachers and uh, false teaching and false teachers? We've got to remember that greater is he that's in us than he that is in us the world. Okay, let's go to the next page in our notes. First John chapter 4 verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another. Oh, praise the Lord. I am so glad we're here to the love part. I love love. Can't we just all get along? I really do. I really do. You know, some people like truth and some people are more like towards the love side. I'll be honest. God says balance love and truth. I tend to be on the love side. I tend to. That's where I, I just really gravitate there. I was the person in, in pickup, when we'd play pickup sports, 
I was that person that I didn't want to, even if I was better athletically than the person, I didn't want to beat the person because I, I just felt unloving. I mean, I'm just, I'm giving you a little glimpse in a window, and I'll tell you how Satan used that against me. I started a church years and years and years ago, and I struggled. I struggled, and, and my sweet wife, she kind of came up alongside of me, and just in a sweet and godly way, she just said, you know, you're, you're really, you're really kind of, you know, I know you're so loving, but you're letting those people that are coming into the church, it's a fast-growing church, you're letting those people kind of influence you, and you're kind of putting that, you're misunderstanding love and the need for truth. She said it better than I'm saying it right now. But in the end, she was right, and, and God, God used her word in my life to kind of help me. But we tend to go to one side or the other, and, and, and being filled with the Holy Spirit should lead us to keep those in balance. Whenever we get them out of balance, we really get in trouble. If you're raising children, if you get that out of balance, it's bad for your kids. If you can keep love and truth in balance with your kids, your kids don't just need harsh truth with no love, and your kids don't just need syrupy love with no truth. It's that whole love and truth. It's, I preached a sermon series about it one time, love, limits, and learning for kids. Love, limits, and learning. We got to have love and truth. All right, so the next page there, you see it, point four. Loving one another demonstrates you know God and you are his child. And not loving one another demonstrates a person does not know God. So circle the word love in verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another. There are three words, could have been used there. Aros, every married man loves that word. It is. Young enough, he won't comprehend this. It is sex in marriage. Eros, biblically, it's not that word. It's, it's not phileo. Like when I go to McDonald's and I order a phileo fish. No, it's not that. The city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's, it's a brotherly kind of love, a sisterly kind of love. It's friendship. I like being around you. You like being around me. It's not that one. It's the hardest one. It's agape. It's a godly love. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's, it's, it's all the way through here. When it's talking about loving one another, it's talking about loving one another self-sacrificially. I want to say this. Write this in your notes. Love is an action word. Action is required. It took, it took me two years of marriage. I've been married with Angela 37 years. It took me the first two years of marriage, I think, to really internalize that concept, that it wasn't about her meeting my needs. It was about me serving her and agape loving her. Every husband in the room right now, if you'll just make a mental note of that, you may already be practicing it, but if you're not, or those of you men, in the future, you want to be married, you hope to be married, if you just make an you can avoid two years of headbutting that my wife had, my, my, my wife and I had when we first married. Agape love. In the church, agape love is I'm, I see something in you. I don't just say, oh, I love you with words, but I go, oh, I love you, and I see a need in your life, and my love compels me to do something about it to meet the need. Now, what's really hard I'm a sucker. So yesterday at the work day, some woman comes up in an old beat up car and she had some story, but it was basically with a handout like this, give me money. I want your church to give me money, money. And I asked questions and there were some red flags and some yellow flags. And, but then I was like, man, she's like an elderly woman. She talked about her husband abusing her and but then things weren't adding up exactly. So I grabbed one of our deacons and our treasurer. I said, what do you think? I mean, pray with me. What do we, you know? And I'm sitting there going, Lord, I'm preparing to talk about test the spirits. There's either a spirit of God going on here or there's a spirit of Satan trying to basically build. You know, there are people that go around. They work the churches. They work the preachers. 
I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker. If I'm gonna, so she wanted 100 bucks, and we compromised and got her 60 You know, but in the back of my mind, she gave her first name. And I'm thinking a few years ago when we were starting a church over in the office warehouse, I think she used to call me all the time asking for money. Just need help this, help that. And it was always a little different story, but she used the same first name. I think it was the same name. But anyway, Lord's in control. Um, that was just a little aside. How many of you are suckers too like that? And you, you see the people on the side of the road and they put on some old clothes. No, <laughs> you're always the one giving them the money so they can go buy some drugs or alcohol. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's somehow balancing love and truth because sometimes they just want to buy drugs, right, and alcohol. And how do you discern? You want to help somebody that's down on their luck. This is real. You need the Spirit of God. He was indwelling me, and I asked him. So maybe the Holy Spirit allowed me to only get hosed $60 instead of the 100 I don't know. Or maybe it was legit. All right, how many of you have ever felt like after you did something like that, you just got hosed? Thank you. I was feeling pretty bad there. I was like, I was all alone. Am I the only one? Loving one another demonstrates you know God and that you are his child and not loving one another demonstrates a person does not know God. So there's three loves there we talked about, but this one's agape love. It's repeated in verse, what verse is that? Is that verse 9? By this, the love of God was manifested to us. We'll get to that. Um, so this is another way, it's another test to see if you are a child of God. You know, what? The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You want a test of whether you're a child of God or that uh, you're a child of the devil? If you don't have God's love for your brothers and sisters, right? then the Bible says then you really don't know God. You've never really known God. So really, just I want to make sure I don't finish this. this. This chapter is really all about trying to keep in balance, you know, that love and that truth. And we, we started off with truth and testing to see if these prophets and teachers are promoting truth, right? Or were they promoting error? But, but now we're squarely in that part where he's saying, if you're a child of God, then you're going to love. But if you're not a child of God, then you're not going to have agape love for the brothers and sisters. For God is love. By the way, real quickly, I know some of you are just psyched about how this book is broken down. In, in chapter 1, God is light. That's a definition of God. God is light. In chapter 4, God is love. In chapter 5, next week, we'll bring a message, and it's God is life. So you have light, love, and life. Right now, we're talking about God's love. A, a very definition of God is God is love. Who is God? God is love. But we can't separate that from chapter 1, which is, who is God? God is light. What is light? Light is truth. L light... Is justice, real justice, God's justice, not man's version of it. By this, the love of God was manifested to us. This one's, this one's, this one psychs me up so much. Y'all look at verse 9 with me. It almost brings me to tears when I read this, particularly kind of when I'm alone. By this, the love of God was manifested to us that God has sent his only begotten son, that's Jesus, into the world so that we might live through him. Isn't that beautiful? Look at verse 10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Wow. The satisfaction, the mercy seat. He sent his son to be the satisfaction, the atonement for our sins. Like in the Old Testament, the, the gold cherubim wings over the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat where once a year the great high priest would bring and, and put blood as a symbol of the atoning work of God once a year for the people of Israel. So
so Christ demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if Christ died for us and if Christ loved us so much, we also, the Bible says, ought to love one another. That's what it's saying. That's what I love about this church so much. Is it is a, it's a church that, yes, is committed to truth, but it's a church that's committed to loving one another. Tertullian said, he was a church father, it is our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Look, they say, how they love one another. Look how they are prepared to die for one another. I wonder how often outsiders would describe modern Christians like that as loving. An 11-year-old girl and her 8-year-old brother used to fight over this the silliest things, and so her father was really surprised one day when his 11-year-old daughter made a really nice birthday card for her 8-year-old brother who was turning 9, and I'm going to read that what she wrote in that card. Happy birthday to my nine-year-old brother. I'm so glad to have you as a brother to love. P.S. Don't read this out loud or I will snap your head off. <laughs> I mean, if we're honest, if we're honest, sometimes we're kind of like that 11-year-old girl. We're trying to love, right? We want to love one another. But let's face it, sometimes in the church, there's just some people that are a little harder to love. But that's where it comes into that agape, filled with the Spirit kind of thing. Turn to the last page. The sixth point is one of the keys to loving one another and knowing we are a child of God is relying on the Holy Spirit who indwells us. So he talks more about the central role of the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us, right? And he indwells us, but he also does what? He fills us. Ephesians chapter 5. We're to be filled or controlled by the Spirit. We're to yield to the Spirit. And that's how we can love one another is by being filled with the Spirit, right? That indwells us. The final point. One of the greatest ways to show the love of Christ to the world is to love your fellow Christians and to proclaim Jesus is the Savior of the world. So in verse, if you look at verse 21... And this commandment we have from him, he's summarizing. What's he saying? That the one who loves God should love his brother also, right? The one who loves God should also love his brother. And if you think about it, Christ wants us to share that love with a lost and dying world. Christ wants us to get that news out. So I'm going to close with this. God is love, but he is also light or justice. One day, every human being will stand before God, and it's going to be at the great white throne judgment, which is actually reserved for all who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. But it's called the Great White Throne Judgment. It's in Revelation uh, chapter 20. And it talks about how they'll be small and great and people who died at sea and on land, but they'll all be before God, before his throne. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So watch, watch what's going to happen. If we kneel before Almighty God, if we repent of our sins and we accept Christ by faith in this life while we have breath, then we will escape that great white throne judgment. Why? Because God, God's loving offer through His Son Jesus to be our, our substitute, we would have accepted that. And therefore, when God the Father looks at us, He sees the righteousness, right? In his son, because God the Father poured out his justice, his light, his wrath fully on Jesus when he died on the cross, right? For all of our sins. He poured it out on Jesus. So before we breathe our last breath, if we have accepted Christ's loving offer for forgiveness and salvation, right? Then we won't be there at the great white throne judgment. For everybody that rejects that, 
in this life, they will be at the great white throne judgment, and now what we're dealing with is not the love of God anymore. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with His justice, His wrath, His light. And basically what He will do is He will pronounce judgment. Now, let me tell you what happened this morning when I was reviewing this early. I begin, and you know me, you know me, I share Jesus. I've led many of you to Christ. But, but let me tell you something, I was so overwhelmed this morning with this thought that we only have a limited number of days, don't we, in this life. We've got the greatest, most loving message to bring to humanity. We can't sit there and fixate and focus on the external stuff. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not saying we bury our head and we forget and we deny the sinfulness. We understand that sin separates us from God. I understand that. But what I'm saying is, is we've got we've to understand that people who are in bondage to all kinds of sin, whatever, whatever it is, it's because their father is the devil, and they're, they're, they're doing the, the will of their father the devil, right? And those of us that have been saved by grace through faith apart from works, we're just as wretched in and of ourselves as, as them people out there, right, that we like to have easy targets with. We're just as wretched. The only difference is we've substituted with Christ, and Christ took the penalty for us. And so this is what got me to sobbing this morning. It was, I got such a limited amount of time. I got to tell as many people as I can. And I know there's the way of the master and basically that they go through and they go through the Ten Commandments and have you committed adultery? Okay, you're an adulterer and if you lied, yes, I've lied. You're a liar. I, I get that. I understand that. But I think probably the better way to look at it is you're not denying the sin issue, but you understand they can't do anything about their sin without Jesus. So we bring Jesus to them. Jesus is the solution. And we, we, I don't deserve to be able to be in God's use in this way, but he's chosen me, he's chosen you. How many of you are Christians here? He's chosen us, right? Chelsea. Aren't you glad Sherry loved you enough? She looked at you, and she, she loved you, and she shared Jesus with you, and she brought you to a church, and you were here three or four months, and you kept hearing about Jesus, 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 this, Jesus, that, and finally you said, Jesus, I surrender all. You got saved, amen? That's, we got to tell people, we got to, we only have a limited amount of time. This is why I was weeping this morning. I was just thinking, I'm not telling enough people. I know I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. But we can tell them who can. We can give them the loving message of hope and forgiveness. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, thank you in spite of the flawed messenger in me. Your word will not return to you void, null and void. It will bring about what you set it out to do. Lord, for us as believers, break us, Lord. Break our hearts. Uh, I'm, I'm getting glimpses of your heart on this, Lord. we got to get the loving message out that you, God, you loved all human beings created in your image so much that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for our sins. God, sink it deep within our souls, Lord. Give us, give us such a fiery passion. Lord, to never, ever, ever, ever point the bony finger at other people, but, but to wrap our arms around them and plead with them to receive the loving forgiveness from you, Jesus Christ. I'm asking this for me. I'm asking it for my brothers and sisters here at Stepping Stones Church. Um, if you're here today and you, you don't know for sure that all your sins are forgiven, you don't know for sure that God the Father is your Father. You're not sure. You're not sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You're not sure if you die today, you might go to hell. 
you're watching this on YouTube, Facebook, uh, listening to it, you know, but you're here um, today, if you don't know for sure, I'm asking you to receive Christ. Ask Christ to take away your sin. You see, when he died on the cross, he paid for all the sins. So all you got to do is just call on the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Why don't you do that right now? If it, it's not from your heart, don't say it. Don't do it. Just only if you really want to receive Christ. I can't save you, but Jesus stands ready to save you. He loves you, and he wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to spend all eternity with him in heaven. Will you receive him now? If it's your desire, pray this prayer of faith. In your own words, say something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned, and I do know my sin separates me from you. I'm sorry for my sin, truly sorry. But I am so grateful, and I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross to pay for my sins. And you rose again the third day, victorious over death, because you're the great God-man. Jesus, save me. Save me from hell. Save me from sin. Save me from myself. I need you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Head bowed and eyes closed. If you just ask Christ to save you, to forgive you of your sins, to give you eternal life, if you just did that, slip your hand up right now. Raise it up high, would you? God bless you. Put that hand down. Anybody else? Today. If you pray to receive Christ or you have questions about the faith, um, those of you watching this or listening to this, um, outside of these four walls, contact us, let us know. We'll be glad to share with you some free information about Christ. And for those of you that have received Christ, information that will help you grow in your newfound faith. I have preached over, and you all have been patient. We are going to have a brief altar call. We're not going to drag it out. But I, I sense we need an altar call today you have questions about the faith, you want to join the church, maybe you're a believer and you're struggling with something, you want somebody to pray with you, I want you to come. We're not going to stand to our feet right now. There's room. Just get up out of your seat right now. Clint and Connie, make your way down here as prayer counselors. Get up right now. Come down. See me. See Clint and Connie. We won't drag it out, but if you want prayer, uh, you come forward right now. We'll pray with you. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for tracking with me. Um, I, I'm so excited. Uh, Sherry, you just keep reaching out to more and more people. One of your fellow managers with Cube Smart. Eddie, what's your last name? McCarver. Ma McCarver. McCarver. So, Eddie, would you stand? Sherry, come up and stand with her so she's not by herself. Um, Eddie McCarver. She's attended here on and off, and uh, she's got her work schedule cl cleared up now on Sundays. She's wanting to join the church. She's promising to go through Discovery, and she needs to be baptized. <laughs> Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry, for standing with her. After church, just make sure and, and let her know how excited you are about her step in the right direction in joining the church. You may be seated. Glory to God. All right. Everybody look at this beautiful woman, our very own Kathy Williams. I know you've been battling medical issues and challenges, Kathy. We love you.